Buying and everything. I need it now. <laughs> That's right. Well, I got it. We're going to have my uh, your bag. Some fond memories out there. Excellent. They're just starting football. I don't know the same of the old Big Ten as you get in Oh, really? Oh, yeah. They don't yeah. treat you right. Yeah. But you have to yeah. have more candidates out there than our grasshoppers this year. Yeah, I know. I can't get used to the school when I need the high school. Oh, yeah. But the full school starts, they can bring it back and start practicing football. Last night, down in my old town down there was the, uh, was the way in, you know, and they brought all the kids in. Mm -hmm. How many on the team weighed that? And he said a lot of them were that way, but he said we had some big guys like Ozzie Simmons. He said, well, Ozzie wasn't big. big. No, Ozzie was a fast back. Oh, he was fast. Dick uh, Crane was the big one. He was a, right. about That's a 210 pound fullback. He mentioned that. Yeah. He was sick, over six foot. And that right. yeah. Ozzie Simmons had yeah. a peculiarity which show him no mercy Schmidt at Ohio State. Yeah. Remember, he had seen him playing high school Sounds football. Sounds like a Democrat. Yeah. <laughs> well, didn't you know that was his nickname? No. So no mercy, Schmidt? I, I, I oh. heard Woody Hayes, you know. Uh, no. Well, yeah. Schmidt had seen Ozzie play as in high school in Texas. Oh, I see. And um, when he was out there, and he saw him break into the clear and approaching his uh, uh, safety man, and Schmidt later said, he knew what was going to happen, and he said because he'd seen it in Texas in high school, and it happened. And he said he just could never forgive himself for not warning his players about it. Ozzie's trick was he held the ball in one hand, and suddenly when he's in an open field and coming up to a tackler, he would hold the ball out. He'd just do that right in the fellow's face, and the guy would make a grab at the ball, and Ozzie was past him. And he did this. And he did it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll be done. Well, listen, back to the... Uh... Oh, this isn't part of the interview? No. <laughs> Actually, this is going pretty good. You want to put this on tonight? There mo I'll tell you tonight, there are more people watching football or getting their kids ready, I'll tell you. Uh, number one, thanks a lot. I, I wanted to just talk today, if I could, about more of your personal feelings through a very tough time in your presidency, and I, uh, you know, uh, this is kind of a demarcation point. Uh, how do you feel about it? Was this well, an embattled time, especially, or? Well, it, it, naturally, it wasn't the happiest of times, and uh, sometimes I'd get annoyed at the interference with what I thought was uh, getting on with the things that should be done, but Hugh, I have to tell you, uh, I never, I never felt too upset because uh, I knew I'd told the truth mm -hmm. and that the, the truth would have to come out and did. But how'd you keep smiling? Because a lot of people wouldn't believe you. Still a lot of people question, uh, you know, whether the, or at least think that uh, you haven't told everything according to the polls. Uh, uh, yes, I did. And what it used to <laughs> make me smile a little bit was the fact that uh, I had, was the first one to tell them mm -hmm. uh, about such things as that there was extra money and so forth. And, mm -hmm. and uh, good Lord, I appointed the first commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came in uh, long before this one started with the, mm -hmm. a lot of the information that, that was new to me and that I had to hear for the first time. This was a pretty heavy seed still. How did you keep uh, your optimism, it was uh, pretty sustained throughout that period. Well, as I say, I just had faith in the truth. I see. There wasn't any doubt about it. What, what was, uh, is, how tough was it, though, to see those close to you affected by this? Was well, that's Reagan not, or well, uh, no. children or old colleagues? Well, I think that those were, that were close around me, uh, uh, kind of took their cue from me, but uh, I did hear from a great many friends who uh, expressed again their, their faith and trust, and that was, that was very pleasant. Mm -hmm. Was there a low point in this uh, eight months or so? No. Anything make you angry? I keep, kept reading these stories about uh, well, sometimes you got sore here and there, well, what people said. Uh, yeah, sometimes, and uh, uh, 
sometimes I, I got a little angry before all of this in uh, finding out uh, when I learned of things that uh, I had not been told. Mm -hmm. Did, was there a period of discouragement at all? No. Never got down that, nope. that far, huh? Nope. You had every faith you were going to come out. Yes. Do you think it's over with pretty much now? I think it is as far as the audience is concerned. Yeah. How did, uh, a number of people have said that the thing that bothers you, friends have told me that, was that were these polls that said the people thought that you were well, holding back. Now, can you recover that? Do you ex fully expect to restore the credibility? Yes, and one thing that did encourage me, it, naturally, no one's going to be overjoyed at seeing a poll that finds that people uh, thought you weren't telling the truth. Yeah. But then one other poll asked an added question, and that was a question of the people who said that they thought I wasn't telling the truth. They asked them, well, you know, what did they think about that? And the overwhelming majority of them thought, well, of course, there are always going to be things that a president shouldn't tell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it threw a whole different aspect then on the, that first question and, and the answers to it. Did you end this period at all? Uh, or how did you feel about the group of men that were involved in this that had been on your staff? How do you end this period now? Uh, with your, uh, your feelings about North and Poindexter and uh, well, McFarland? Uh, I heard them out. I can understand why they uh, did what they did and what their motives were, and certainly they weren't bad motives. And uh, I'm just sorry that, uh, that it turned out that way. Mm -hmm. The truth that I told the first time, once uh, Ed Meese came in here and said there was a piece of paper that indicated there was more money uh, than the purchase price of the weapons and that somehow that money was in a Swiss bank account and so forth. Uh, all I fall back on is I am the one who went on the air and told uh, the people that and told the press that in the press room and that we, I had appointed a commission to find out Mm -hmm. what there was to know about this. What was your big mistake, or was there one in all of this? Do you pinpoint something you shouldn't have done, or should have done, <laughs> but you didn't do? Uh, well, you see, in a covert operation like that, you t and the, the covert operation was <coughs> a response by us to an appeal from this other group of individuals who wanted to discuss uh, better relations with our country. And uh, it had to be covert uh, for their safety because uh, they were not, contrary to what uh, some of the people have said, uh, I was not doing business with the Khomeini. Mm -hmm. In fact, quite the contrary. These were people that were uh, anticipating another government to follow him. And if you'll remember at that particular time, Almost every day there were reports of his failing health and that his days were very numbered and so forth. And uh, they wanted to talk about uh, a better relation than, than we have with the present government. How'd you get through those days when the hearing started, Mr. President? Did you, uh, did you read the papers as normal? Did you follow it closely in the papers? Actually, I didn't change, <laughs> I didn't change my pattern or my schedule uh, much at all. I uh, occasionally, uh, uh, I might have a few minutes and step into the next room and turn on the TV just to see who was on and so mm -hmm. forth, but, uh, and uh, I didn't have to depend on the, on the press. Uh, uh, our legal counsel kept mm -hmm. me informed. So you had the summary. internal yes. information as well. Yeah. Did you give up any reading at all? Did you? Uh, Try to avoid it at all, or was it just? No, I see. No, but you watched a little of it. Did you talk it over with Mrs. Reagan? Oh yeah, did we she used to kept an eye on it. Uh, well, she probably didn't watch any more than I did. I see. Yeah. But you felt current throughout the time. You felt yeah. you knew what was. Uh, yeah. What was happening? Huh? Yeah. What? Uh, what is your f feeling in general? Is this sort of thing inevitable? 
in this office at some time or another in the presidency. I've been through seven presidents and it seems to me every administration at one time or another has... There's an investigation by the Congress Well, the something that goes sour, mm -hmm. you know, or something goes off. Uh, uh, what's your broad uh, view of it? Is it... Uh, well, you actually... Uh, all that I remember is, you know, for a half a century now, with only an exception of a few years, the uh, Congress, both houses, had been uh, of one party. And uh, I think if you check back, uh, every president of the opposite party has been investigated for something mm -hmm. or other. Mm -hmm. But I don't recall any investigations of uh, the presidents when the presidents and the legislature were of the same party. Yeah, I see. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, well, what you're suggesting, if I'm correct, is that uh, there's a lot of politics in this. The presidential election have much to do with Well, it, I'm not going to comment on you're that. You're not going to no, comment? You're no. going to stay on that. <laughs> I see. Maybe I, I see. shouldn't have said what I just said. That's right. Well, now, did you, did you keep a diary throughout this time? Do you have well, I've kept a diary thoughts? from the first day here. Yeah. And the, actually, Hugh, the reason for that was uh, one thing I learned after the eight years as governor, mm -hmm. that the, the schedules are such, and the succession of things and the meetings, that getting out of that eight-year experience as governor, I suddenly realized that uh, memories uh, mm -hmm. were, uh, well, I, there were things that I could remember, but I couldn't tell you whether they were in the first or the second term. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I realized there were a lot of things that I just could not, if I had to, recall, and it was a very busy eight years there. Mm -hmm. And so, when we faced with this job, Nancy and I both said, uh, this time, <laughs> keep that record, let's huh? keep a record so that that won't happen. Through this particular uh, stressful period, then you've uh, kept pretty good notes on it. As a matter of fact, uh, I made some of those diary notes available to the, uh, yes, I do. the investigators. Uh -huh. Somebody told me you also uh, kept your regular meetings with Edmund Morris. Uh, he's working on the book. Yes. So that, uh, yeah. There is that. Any surprises when that comes out? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, not to me. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. You know that. Did you expect when you became president, having seen, of course, what happened to Lyndon Johnson and Nixon and uh, Truman and all of them, as you mentioned before, did you expect that anything like this would happen, that there would be an episode in your presidency? Were you prepared for that possibility, I guess what I'm saying? Well, I think, Hugh, I think after the eight years as governor also, uh, you know that, uh, <laughs> uh, that there's always a, uh, a target painted on the chief executive's mm -hmm. door. Yeah. And uh, no, the big surprise, however, was Exactly what we said. First of all, my reaction when our covert operation was exposed by that leak in Beirut and our press immediately went up with it, my reaction there was just one of, and I voiced it to the press at every opportunity, and then it was echoed by David Jacobson, the uh, hostage that came home at about the same time, and that was, please, you can get some people killed. Mm -hmm. by talking about this and asking about it. Uh, and I had in mind the people we were de dealing with as well as uh, our own hostages because when Jacobson came out, uh, the word we had was that there were going to be a couple of more in just a few days. Yeah. And that was all that was on my mind. Well then, when, uh, as I say, Ed Meese was the one that saw that one paper that indicated that uh, there was somehow more money and in a Swiss bank account. Uh, this was just the biggest surprise in the world mm -hmm. because we hadn't set out uh, to trade hostages for, or arms for hostages, uh, even though I have always, I always feel a great responsibility to do everything possible to get back the hostages except ransom. And uh, 
Uh, I knew that the arms we sold were uh, priced at $12 million, and we got our $12 million. Mm -hmm. That had come back uh, before the exposure and all. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just such a surprise that first, well, the very next morning, he agreed with me that we had to make this known. And we called in the joint leadership of the Congress, both houses and both parties, and uh, told them. And then I went immediately into the press room. And then, as you know, a yeah. short time later, went on the air. What a, one of the points in this whole thing, Mr. President, was why did the failure or the re, or the fact you didn't just summon Oliver North and say, you know, lay this all out for me. Was there some reason or some... Well, whether our, th whether our thinking was wrong, right or wrong, at that point, uh, and we were all agreed here that, that um, with this now exposed and my not having been told mm -hmm. that uh, they just had to leave the National Security Council. They could not continue. So I thought of that before I thought of any questions or anything. And, uh, and I think they both felt the same way. And, and it got swept yeah. up in all the the litigation or the yeah. process that yeah. I see. But finally, how do you think history will deal with this, looking down the road? Do well, you think it's going to fade away in the, in the minds of people in the next few years? Or? Well, it is my hope that uh, once everything is settled and known, uh, history will deal with it as uh, the big investigation that finally uh, discovered the president was telling the truth from the very beginning. I see, I see. And that, and uh, will you still be in office uh, when that's established, do you think? <laughs> well, I would like to see it established very quickly. Yeah. I see, I see. Is it getting tougher in your judgment, now you've been here seven years, tougher to run this place in this city? You invented the term inside the beltway, which implies a certain environment that doesn't reflect national sentiment. Uh, has that become uh, increasingly difficult to, to work in? Well, I don't know whether it's any different than it's been for anyone else. I do know that for years back, uh, there has been uh, a kind of friction of, uh, between the executive branch and the legislature mm -hmm. and an attempt to erode the powers of the, of the president. Mm -hmm. And uh, Has that gotten worse? I don't really know. I, uh, because I came here with minus some powers that previously uh, presidents had had. Naturally, seeing it from the executive office side, I believe what's being attempted is a mistake. I think there are some things that just can't be run by a committee of 535 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you stop to think back over history, we have been in my life, well, in the lifetime of the nation, I should say, uh, five declared wars. But history will reveal that presidents have sent military forces of the United States into action 125 times. Mm -hmm. And uh, without it being a declared war, and on the assumption of the executive branch that it was essential for the security of the United States to do that. Your feeling then is that uh, in all the actions you took, to the extent you knew anyway, it was perfectly legal. There wasn't yes. any problem with the um, War Powers Act or your authority or any of that. No. I see. What, uh, going back to that one question, you do not see then any evil men involved in this on our side. I'm talking about your NSC, White House, uh, nobody that you would point to as a, as a culprit or somebody. Well, this would get me into trying to comment on all that took place mm -hmm. in all these, in, the, yeah. uh, in these hearings and all, and I can't say that not having seen them any more than that, getting summaries of them of the day that uh, I just don't think that I should okay. risk making such an assertion yeah. okay. uh, of all of the people that have been mentioned in the hearings. It's getting rather uh, lengthy roster, but yes. <laughs> take it from the other side then. Who was the most help in, throughout this period for you in terms of morale and uh, guidance? You know, it had to be 
somewhat of a burden added on to the normal job. What do you mean outside of my wife? Number one, she was, <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yes, but no, from the very beginning. Uh, not only the people here, uh, in the White House, uh, and some outside, but also uh, uh, friends and supporters uh, mm -hmm. that have gone out of their way from the very beginning to express their confidence uh, in me, and, uh, and it was very heartwarming. Now, how's your wife buck you up, uh, Miss Reagan? Uh, well, because uh, it's she, those days. she knew I'd told the truth, too. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. Uh, uh, well, you answered that. A lot of comment, Mr. President, that uh, you seem older and uh, look older. How do you feel? I read the Wall Street Journal this morning. I suppose you did, too, uh, a long piece about it. No, I haven't read the Journal this morning. Whoops. <laughs> which which uh, <laughs> summary? Is there something in there about that? Well, it just had, yeah, it had a piece in column eight saying, you know, the president uh, seemed to be losing steam in this. Uh, you know, it was one of those ambiguous pieces to be true. But anyway, there, a lot of comment on that, that the uh, feeling that uh, you were slowing down in these last uh, months, not only because of the burden, but just because of, uh, you're just older. <laughs> I don't know about any slowing down. I do know that the, uh, other than my nose, the <laughs> last operation that I had, uh, mm -hmm. I did without anesthetic and got up off the table and went upstairs and put on my ranch clothes and uh, went to Camp David. It was a Friday oh, yeah. and uh, finished the day with a swim there and the next day with a horseback ride. and. Uh, some doctors seem to be a little surprised that uh, <laughs> uh, that I could have done that. Mm -hmm. They didn't think it was ordinary. But no, I I feel just fine, and I haven't I haven't slowed down any. The uh, the pace is the same, and every night the schedule for the next day and the, the homework for the next day arrives, and that's my bedtime reading and so forth, and. Uh, well, the other part of that theory is that uh, your friend said that you were going to be more combative than normal in these last 18 months. Well, that would have been true even without this other thing. Mm -hmm. And that has to be because I think we've accomplished a great many things in these six and a half years. I think the fact that we're within two months of having the longest expansion period in the nation's history, mm -hmm. economic expansion yeah. and all, but I think there are things that I will regret all my life if we don't get them pinned down. Mm -hmm. And so that, it, well, for one thing, the great problem that from the very beginning has faced us, the deficit, that I had thought at one time we could uh, get balanced. But that was during the campaign, and I had had a group of economists who were working on the plan that we followed. Mm -hmm. But no one's ever asked me, so I'll tell you, before the election, those economists came to me and told me that the deterioration had now been so much greater than when they made their study that no, there was no way that we were going to, in a few years, be able to balance the budget. But we put the plan into effect anyway, aimed at whenever it can happen. But now, with this deficit spending uh, and our economic bill of rights, as we call it, that is based on some things that are just essential, and that is a balanced budget amendment. Mm -hmm. And it's a strange thing uh, when I heard some of the congressmen talking about their obligation to the people and to do what the people want. The polls show that 80 percent of the people want a balanced budget amendment. The I see that. The, the Constitution. Have come yeah. out on that. Yeah. And uh, also what 43 governors have and what I had as governor, and that is the right of line item veto. I think those are essential tools. I would like to see those in place and a program in place, well, the Graham Rudman Hollings program is dedicated to this also, that is aiming at a point down here where the budget will be balanced and from then on have to stay balanced. Mm -hmm. Having had that in our Constitution, I think about 44 states have that in their state constitutions. Mm -hmm. We had it in California, and I have to tell you, it is a guarantee mm -hmm. when you know that as executive officer you're responsible that 
when the, you come to the end of the budget year, uh, the revenues have to have matched the outgo. Mm -hmm. And of course, the answer to those people who think that, uh, well, then let's just raise the, the revenues. Mm -hmm. Well, we've done that a few times. Mm -hmm. And if you want to look back in history, virtually every tax increase has led to lower revenues mm -hmm. when the rates were higher because of the lack of incentive and the search by people to find uh, uh, yeah, tax shelters and so forth. And since our tax cuts have gone into effect, <clears throat> the revenues now are bigger. Mm -hmm. And to those liberal-minded individuals who always want to aim at the top earners and say, make them pay the heaviest load, they do pay the heaviest load. And the truth of the matter is, the top earners today are paying a higher percentage of the total rev revenue, are paying mm -hmm. a higher percentage of the total tax than they were before, mm -hmm. even though their rates have been reduced. Now that means that they, there is the proof that those people who were in brackets where they looked for tax shelters and so forth, mm -hmm. or didn't earn extra money because it wasn't worth it, now with a lower tax rate, the incentive is there for them to yeah. mm -hmm. produce more. And as a result, they do pay a higher tax, even yeah. though it's, on, uh, it's at a lesser, a lower rate. Yeah. One more. So you're three minutes late for your final point yeah. oh. One more question here. You've had five careers as a kid, as a sportscaster, as a, a movie actor, as a governor, and a president. Which has been most fun? <laughs> well, I have to tell you something. I have been blessed. I've enjoyed every one of them. I am still <laughs> yeah. very proud of Seven Summers as a Lifeguard. I <laughs> see. Uh, that ranks right up yes, there. Yes, I had a log with 77 <laughs> notches in it for that. <laughs> who had pulled out. Uh, but then, uh, sports announcing, I thought that was my career. And uh, yet I had always, uh, going through school, high school and college, I'd always, in addition to athletics, I'd always been involved in the dram dram dramatic clubs and that sort of thing in the class plays. And when uh, out of the blue, literally, uh, came an opportunity to, to switch from sports announcing to acting, uh, and I loved that. And I, all I can tell you is, I fought like a tiger against ever running for office. I thought that was for someone else, that I would do what I had done for other candidates, like my speeches for Barry Goldwater, that I would campaign for others. And when I was beset in 1965 by this group that insisted that I had to seek the governorship uh, against the incumbent governor then because the party was divided and all, I fought like a tiger not to. And finally, I couldn't <laughs> sleep nights. And Nancy and I said yes. But then, I have to tell you, we'd only been there a few months. And one night, we looked at each other sitting in the living room at Sacramento and said, this makes everything else we've ever done look as dull as dishwater. <laughs> so you went, on, went the yeah. distance. Now, what are you going to do when you get out? Uh, well, a lot more ranching than I get to do now. Mm -hmm. And I anticipate that. I look forward to that. But um, I have a hunch I will be back on the mashed potato circuit campaigning for things I believe in and people I believe in. What are you going to do on this vacation, Mr. President? You're going to do some front to the cooler season, and you have fires going in both fireplaces all day long. Um, You're a good we'll be doing man. that, but every morning we'll be riding. I see. I saw. I was up at Ralph Regula's office the other day, and uh, and he, he has uh, pictures of you. You sent to him making a fence out of yes. telephone poles. You well, still do that? Did he explain to you why? Yeah. He's got the pictures? Yeah. Because he, he's got some property and wanted a fence. And uh, <laughs> I tried to give him all the directions and write the directions that I could, and then I did. I sent him pictures to show him. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah. yeah, you're running behind, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Well, you're on tonight. You got any butterflies? Are you up to this one? Well, mm -hmm. I'll be sitting at the same desk so I can always duck. You've done that before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad you got around to some of the future here because that's what yeah. I'd expected to talk about was yeah. what we are going to do for the next seven yeah. months. Yeah. Well, I was just curious, a personal response through a tough yeah. time, you know, and now on to the, to the next one.
as near as I can tell. I mean, a lot can happen in, what, 18 months, I guess. Yeah. Don't yeah. walk away with that. I'm ready to tear a necktie. Okay, that's great. Well, enjoy your vacation, Mr. Right. Well, you, you look in good shape. No, you look better shape than I feel. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you for some uh, kind words on the weekend show. I like those guys. Yes. They often up yeah, between you and Jack. Yeah, that's great. The only friends. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot.